What was Aristotle's main contribution to Western philosophy? Aristotle, 384-322b CE, curbed the strain of intellectual mysticism that had been inaugurated by Parmenides. C 515 to 450 BCE, and he formalized common sense in ways that checked the speculative excesses of his teacher. Plato, C 428 C 348 BCE. This enabled a solid foundation for empiricism. Or knowledge based on sensory observation and direct experience. Aristotle accomplished his task via encyclopedic accounts of the existing knowledge of his day. Assessments of that knowledge, and developments of it into new areas, using new methods of thought. He was a rare combination of a highly well-informed and diligent scholar and an original thinker. Like his 19th century successor George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. 1770 to 1831, Aristotle was capable of thinking the whole world. But unlike Hegel, he thought of the whole world not as an abstract and speculative theorist would but as an ordinary person would, if he or she could do that. How did Anaximander seek to revise Thales' philosophy? Anaximander, c. 610 to 545 BCE, was interested in the idea of what was hot and dry. This was supposed by him to be opposed to Thales' idea of water, which was cold and wet. He reasoned that water could not be the primary substance out of which everything else was made because the primary substance must be the cause of all the others. Since water is wet and often cold, it cannot be the source of anything that is hot and dry. Therefore, Anaximander reasoned. The primary substance must be something different from both water and things that are hot and dry. Anaximander called his primary substance. Which cannot be perceived only things that are cold and wet or hot and dry can be perceived a pyron. Or that which is eternal and causes other things to change but does not change itself. A pyron, in other words, is that thing which can't be perceived itself but which is the origin of all things hot and cold, wet and dry. And for how these things change it is responsible for everything in the world as we can and do perceive it. According to Anaximander, we see the sun, moon and stars through holes in a cold, wet vapor that encloses earth. On earth, wet and dry have formed land and sea. And living things are the result of the sun's effect on moisture. All life started in the sea, according to Anaximander. A theory that actually anticipates the theory of evolution. What was unusual about Vico's autobiography? Vico told the story of his life. Life of Guy Ambatis Vico written by himself. 
1725-1728, in the third person, and he analyzed both the effect of his circumstances on his temperament and how his ideas developed before he began writing. His autobiography is thus his intellectual history. Here is how it begins, Signor Gaiambatis de Vico. He was born in Naples in the year 1670 of upright parents, who left behind them a very good reputation. The father was of cheerful humor, the mother of a quite melancholy temper. And both came together in the fair disposition of this little son of theirs. As a boy he was very lively and restless, but at the age of seven he fell headfirst from high on a ladder to the floor. And remained a good five hours motionless and senseless. Fracturing the right side of the cranium without breaking the skin, hence from the fracture arose a shapeless tumor. And from the many deep lancings of it the child lost a great deal of blood. Such that the surgeon, having observed the broken cranium and considering the long state of unconsciousness, made the prediction that he would either die of it or he would survive stolid. However, neither of the two parts of this judgment, by the grace of God, came true. But as a result of this illness and recovery he grew up, from then on, with a melancholy and acrid nature which necessarily belongs to ingenious and profound men, who through ingenuity flash like lightning in acuity, through reflection take no pleasure in witticism and falsity. How did Elaine Locke apply pragmatism to issues of race and culture? Locke was interested in values and valuation, cultural pluralism, and race relations. He argued that each cultural group has a distinct identity which should not conflict with the citizenship of its members in a wider whole. Thus, African Americans could have the cultural identity, i.e.s. supported by the Harlem Renaissance and remain Americans. This model of identity was the intellectual foundation of Locke's efforts in promoting black culture but some now view it as an applied pragmatic strategy. Locke believed that black identity was largely the result of economic and political forces and not biology. However, his pragmatic strategy was not to argue this belief directly, but to promote an understanding of race as culture within a broader society that emphasized false biological notions of race toward the goal of eventual racial equality. Who were some of Robert Boyle's scientific influences? Pierre Gassendi 1592 to 1655 and Walter Charlton 1619 to 1707 influenced Boyle. In 1656 Charlton brought Gassendi's ideas about atoms to England with his Physiologia Epicuro Gassendo Chartania. Or a fabric of science natural upon the hypothesis of atoms. Founded by Epicurus, repaired by Petrus Gassendus, augmented by Walter Charlton, 1654. Charlton revised Gassendi's view that everything, including the soul, 
was made up of material atoms. This view entailed that the soul was a physical thing. Which was against the beliefs of most theologians and members of the clergy. What was unusual about Carl Friedrich Gauss' personality? Gauss, 1777-1855, was meticulous, conservative, and did not much enjoy teaching or other disruptions of his work. He did not collaborate or help younger mathematicians. Neither did he appreciate interruptions. It is said that he was once concentrating on a problem when told that his wife was dying. He responded, tell her to wait a moment till I'm done. How did Copernicus change the Ptolemaic system? The system introduced by Nicolaus Copernicus, 1473-1543, was that Earth and all of the planets revolved around the Sun in concentric circles. Copernicus was further able to reduce the number of postulated epicycles to 34, still saving the appearances, or not contradicting what was observed. This shifted the fundamental frame of astronomical reference from Earth to the fixed stars. As he wrote, first and above all lies the sphere of the fixed stars containing itself and all things, for that reason immovable, in truth the frame of the universe, to which the motion and position of all other stars are referred. Though some men think it to move in some way. We assign another reason why it appears to do so in our theory of the movement of the earth. Of the moving bodies first comes Saturn, who completes his circuit in triple X years. After him, Jupiter, moving in a 12-year revolution. Then Mars, who revolves biennially. Fourth in order an annual cycle takes place. In which we have said is continued the Earth, with the lunar orbit as an epicycle. In the fifth place Venus is carried round in nine months. Then Mercury holds the sixth place, circulating in the space of 80 days. Copernicus' conclusions were based mainly on mathematics. Drawing on the perennial value of simplicity and the doctrine that nature always behaves in the most commodious, simple, way. To the objection that objects would fly off a moving earth, he responded that a moving sky, because it was larger, would move even faster and do more damage. What are these various specializations and subfields of philosophy? Various specializations of philosophy and their subject matters include, ethics, how human beings ought to behave in matters involving human well-being or harm, philosophy of science, answers to questions of what science is, how science progresses, and the nature of scientific truth. Social and political philosophy, accounts of how society and government work as institutions. 
what their purposes should be, how they came into being as institutions and how their problems can be fixed. Epistemology, answers to questions about what knowledge is. How we know that something is true, and the relation between sense perception and abstract truths. Metaphysics, the most general questions and answers about the nature of reality, what physical things are. What relations exist between different kinds of things, and the connections between the mind and the world. Philosophy of mind, how the mind works, whether it is dependent on the brain. How it is connected to the body, the nature of memory and personal identity. Aesthetics, the study of art toward an understanding of what beauty is and how artworks are different from natural things and other man-made objects. Ancient philosophy, the birth of Western philosophy from about 800 BCE to 400 CE. It is composed mostly of Greek and Roman thought before Christianity. Medieval philosophy, the development of philosophical thought. From about 400 CE until the Renaissance in the 1300s in Europe in which Christianity provided the dominant worldview and organizing principle for daily life. Modern philosophy, the foundations of contemporary philosophy from the 1600s through the 1800s. 19th century philosophy, the classical period of modern philosophy. In which Friedrich Hegel, Immanuel Kant, and John Stuart Mill wrote. Analytic philosophy, style of professional philosophy. Which is abstract and technical, that developed during the 20th century. Postmodern philosophy, school of thought that, in the second half of the 20th century. Consisted of reactions against many of the shared assumptions held by philosophers over the centuries. What is feminist reclamation? In philosophy, as well as other fields, Feminist reclamation has been the rediscovery of women thinkers who have been neglected in traditional intellectual history, especially before the 1980s. Some of these women are considered philosophers only if philosophy is broadly construed. But others worked comprehensively on issues central to their field influenced their peers, and have only recently been fully recognized for their achievements. A strong example of this category is Ruth Barkin Marcus. What is hedonic calculus? According to Jeremy Bentham, courses of action should be chosen based on their consequences in terms of the pleasure and pain experienced by all involved. Everyone counts for one, and no one counts for more than one. All pleasures are on the same level, and in Bentham's famous words, all quantity of pleasure being equal, Pushpin is as good as poetry. Pushpin was a bowling type game of the time. The value of justice reduces to its greater utility over injustice. Punishment, for example. 
is only just or unjust in terms of its consequences as a deterrent to future crime. Bentham's hedonic calculus consisted of literally quantifying pleasures and pains according to these factors. How near or far, how long-lasting, how intense. How likely to cause pleasure or pain of the same kind, and how many are affected. Did Russell have a humorous side? Although he suffered from depression on and off throughout his life, this did not suppress Russell's wit. As the following quotes show, the whole problem with the world is that Fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves, and wiser people so full of doubts. I would never die for my beliefs because I might be wrong. It has been said that man is a rational animal. All my life I have been searching for evidence which could support this. Aristotle maintained that women have fewer teeth than men, although he was twice married. It never occurred to him to verify this statement by examining his wives' mouths. Who was Friedrich Schelling? The literary and artistic romantics of his era deeply influenced the Philosophy of Arthur Friedrich Wilhelm Joseph Schelling, 1776-1854 He studied at Tübinger Stift, the seminary of the Protestant Church in Württemberg, and graduated from the philosophy faculty there in 1792. He then attended lectures at the University of Leipzig while working as a tutor to aristocratic youth. At the age of 23 he received an unprecedented offer to teach philosophy at the University of Jena. He subsequently held chairs at the universities at Wurtburg, Erlangen, Munich, and finally Berlin, where he was expected to oppose the Hegelians. His primary motivation in philosophy appears to have been aesthetic and he became known for his nature philosophy, as developed in his system of transcendental idealism, 1800. What is Buddhism? Buddhism was founded in India by Siddhartha Gautama. The majority of Indian scholars place his lifespan as C563 C483 BCE Indian Buddhism divided into Theravada or Hinayana or lesser vehicle, and Mahayana, or greater vehicle. Indian Buddhism was no longer a vibrant religion in India after the 13th century but it had by then spread geographically. Theravada Buddhism is practiced in Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Sri Lanka. Mahayana Buddhism is practiced in China, Japan, Nepal, and the United States. Tibetan Buddhism, in addition to including the greater and lesser vehicles, has a form known as Varayana. All of the three vehicles are practiced in Himalayan parts of Mongolia, northeastern China, and Russia. Zen Buddhism is practiced in Japan as a kind of meditation called Zazen that repudiates texts. 
even though there is a written tradition, and focuses on unmediated direct experience. Zen originated in India and emerged in China in the 7th century CE, from which it spread to Vietnam, Korea, and Japan. Zen includes Yoga Cara, which is a form of philosophical idealism that uses Yoga exercises to achieve disbelief in the existence of physical objects. What were the main ideas of the scientific revolution? Some of the key ideas and theories that came out of the scientific revolution were that Earth revolves around the Sun. Matter is composed of small particles. Everything that happens can be explained mechanically or mechanistically with the help of mathematics. General principles or natural laws must be supported by observable data, and Perhaps most important, that science itself is an exciting activity that will benefit mankind. How did Peter Lombard answer his question of whether God was the cause of evil and sin? God is of course good and has a good nature. Out of this good nature, God created an angel. This angel became evil after God created him and passed his evil on to man. Evil in Man resulted in sin. God was therefore not the first cause of either human evil or sin. Lombard's explanation is similar to how we would explain how a good parent has a bad child at some point. The creation or offspring is morally responsible for itself and Lombard located that point originally in an angel. Lombard, c. 1095-1160, wrote about this and other issues in his four-volume book of sentences. 1145 to 1151, that soon became a standard text for theological training that was in use until the mid 1200s. Others would begin with his work and then develop their own ideas on its basis. What did Descartes mean by clear and distinct ideas? Descartes thought that there was a natural light of reason by which one could be sure of one's thoughts. Descartes wrote in his Principles of Philosophy, 1644. I term that clear which is present and apparent to an attentive mind, in the same way that we see objects clearly when being present to the regarding eye, they operate upon it with sufficient strength. But the distinct is that which is so precise and different from all other objects that it contains within itself nothing but what is clear. In other words, the thinker has an intuitive or direct experience of clarity and about what he or she is clear about. Descartes was relying on our ability to recognize when we know something for sure in all its detail. What are some of the main themes in philosophy of biology?
philosophers of biology are interested in how biological explanations differ in form. From explanations in the other sciences regarding whether the behavior of living things can be predicted. And in how environment, genetics. And processes of development interact to result in organisms. They are also interested in evolutionary theory. Useful texts in philosophy of biology include, Alexander Rosenberg, Structure of Biological Science. 1985, Elliot Sober, The Nature of Selection, 1984, and Michael Ruse, Philosophy of Biology, 1973. Most contemporary philosophers of biology rely on Ernst Mayer's The Growth of Biological Thought. Diversity, Evolution, and Inheritance 1982, and Towards a New Philosophy of Biology, Observations of an Evolutionist, 1988. Additional thought by biologists have also resulted in new perspectives on biology that include work by Patrick Battison, Richard Dawkins, Jared Diamond, Stephen Jay Gould, Richard Lewontin, John Maynard Smith, and Edward O. Wilson. Also, Evolutionary biology has inspired new philosophical systems of thought for example, by Daniel Dennett. What is continental philosophy? Existentialism Phenomenology, Critical Theory and Structuralism all represent what is now called Continental Philosophy. Existentialism is a philosophical perspective on the world, which begins from the standpoint of one individual in ways that apply to all individuals. Phenomenology is a more abstract and systematic development of the processes of individual knowing and understanding. Existentialists have tended to be more literary than phenomenologists. Critical theory is a 20th century development of the theoretical methodology of Marxism. Structuralism is an application of a number of continental traditions to social criticism. Resulting in analyses of social structures. One thing they all have in common is that their original foundational ideas came from European thinkers. But more than geography is at stake with this name. Continental philosophy is often contrasted with Anglo American analytic philosophy, which has dominated in 20th century philosophy departments in American colleges and universities. Since philosophy became a profession in higher education during the 1930s, it should be noted that what is true of American academic philosophy departments has not been true of English. French, and German departments in the United States, which over the 20th century welcomed continental philosophy into their curricula. Moreover, continental philosophy is not alone in its stepchild status among American professional philosophers. Because the same thing happened to American philosophy, also known as pragmatism, after the 1950s. Why did George Berkeley like tar water so much?
Some biographers claim that George Berkeley suffered the constant discomforts of constipation over his entire life, until finally, in late middle age, he found lasting relief in tar water, which is an extract of tree bark. The following appears in a century of anecdotes from 1760 to 1860, by John Timms. Bishop Berkeley having received benefit from the use of tar water, when ill of the colic, published a work on the virtues of tar water, and a few months before his death, a sequel. Entitled Further Thoughts on Tar Water, and when accused of fancying he had discovered a nostrum in tar water. He replied, that, to speak out, he freely owns he suspects tar water is a panacea. What were Leo Strauss' main politically relevant ideas? Strauss, 1899-1973, was mainly a classical political theorist. He believed that an important connection between real-life politics and philosophy began with Socrates, 460-399b. CE, Trial and Conviction. He argued that, since Socrates, Philosophers had hidden their meanings to escape political persecution. Strauss developed a theory of reading as a way for independent thinkers to uncover the true intentions behind necessarily obscure texts. Strauss did not believe that the social science distinction between facts and values was fundamental. This distinction held that statements about what should be the case cannot be logically deduced from statements about what is the case. He held that politics could not be studied without prior values. Strauss thought that human excellence and political virtue had been neglected. As a result of the importance placed on individual freedom in modern liberalism, because liberalism as a doctrine led to relativism, it could be subject to two kinds of nihilism, a brutal nihilism, as in Nazi Germany or Communist Russia, which erased existing foundations of society to enshrine new ideals, or a gentle nihilism that led to permissive egalitarianism, as in American culture. Strauss apparently endorsed noble lies as a political means for correcting contemporary abuses. According to new political philosophy based on the esoteric readings of classical texts, a noble lie is a lie told to people who will benefit from believing it. However, he himself had no clear solutions to tensions between reason and religion or modern versus ancient political philosophy. Who was Aspasia of Miletus? Aspasia of Miletus, c. 470 C 400 BCE, was an influential member of the Sophistic movement. She was married to Pericles, 495 to 429 BCE, considered to be knowledgeable about statecraft, and was said to have taught Socrates himself rhetoric. When she was put on trial on charges of impiety, her husband secured her acquittal.
What was David Hume's great ambition in philosophy? Hume sought to create a science of the mind, using empiricist methods in the same way that Isaac Newton. 1642-1727, had created a science of the physical world. Who was Queen Christina and why was she important in Descartes' life? René Descartes' second royal correspondent and student, Queen Christina, 1626-1689, of Sweden, was a less conventional figure than his other pupil, Princess Elizabeth. Although her philosophical skills and subsequent historical legacy were not as great, Christina's father raised her as a prince. And when she assumed the crown she took the title of King Christina. During her reign she greatly expanded the number of noble titles and extravagantly spent down the treasury. Most notably for New Sweden, a colonization of America in an area near Willington, Delaware. Christina abdicated in 1664, changing her name to Maria Christina Alexandra. She did this to convert to Catholicism, which was then illegal in Sweden. Maria Christina went first to Rome and then France. She enjoyed great attention as a former queen and was an active patroness of science and the arts. She was remembered for her shocking male dress, a short skirt, stockings and high heels which allowed for greater freedom of movement than the long skirts women wore at the time. Greta Garbo portrayed Queen Christina in a 1933 film that was highly acclaimed critically but did not do well at the box office. How are dogs like cynics? The English word cynic comes from the Greek kin, which means dog. Diogenes of Sinope thought people could learn much from dogs, who were not ashamed of their bodily functions, not picky eaters, and did not care where they slept. Dogs ne either worry, nor care about academic philosophy. And they know immediately if someone is a friend or an enemy. What's more, dogs, unlike humans, are honest. Like a dog, Diogenes had no use for family structures. Social organizations, politics, private property, or good reputation. He is said to have masturbated in the Agora, marketplace and replied to those who insulted him by urinating on them. He also gestured at others with his middle finger. Plato described him as a Socrates gone mad. Because of his contempt for convention and knowledge of philosophy, many considered Diogenes a man of wisdom. Alexander the Great once sought Diogenes out, when the philosopher was bathing in his wine barrel. Which he did often because of a painful skin condition. When Alexander offered to give him anything in the world he wanted. Diogenes replied, please get out of my sunlight, or words to that effect.
What was Aristotle's theory of the virtues? Aristotle believed that virtue, or moral goodness, is a form of practical wisdom. It is neither determined by nature, nor is it precluded by nature. It is the result of thought, action, and habit. However, not everyone can be virtuous, according to Aristotle. His necessary conditions for virtue included, high social status, wealth, good looks, being male, and being a free citizen. The specific virtues Aristotle talked about were limited to the traits admired in the ruling classes of the ancient world, pride, generosity, courage, nobility, temperance. This was partly the result of snobbery, and partly due to his sense that the practice of virtue required freedom from labor and drudgery. Still, Aristotle's ideas about how virtue is acquired and practiced can be made relevant to all adults in our own more democratic times. Moreover, we can add the virtues we care about. For example, compassion. To his limited list, Aristotle thought that we become virtuous. First through proper training as children and second by doing the acts that correspond to the virtues in question. For example, to become courageous, it is necessary to perform courageous acts over a period of time. Virtue for human beings, as for all other things, is the excellence of what makes them human. And what makes us human is our reason, our ability to think actively. Therefore, it is important that we deliberate before acting in ways that will develop our virtues. For example, the courageous acts performed by a courageous person must be done for the right reasons. The virtuous actions of good people will be performed because they already have the virtues in question. But every situation is unique, which is why virtuous action calls for rational deliberation beforehand. Aristotle advised that a good rule of practical reason is to aim for the middle or mean. Courage, for example, is usually somewhere between cowardice and foolhardiness. In aiming for the mean in this way, we should overcorrect for our known faults. Thus, because we tend to be fond of pleasure, we should subject choices that are pleasant to a special scrutiny. What was tragic about Schlick's death? After the Nazis came to power in Germany and Austria, many members of the Vienna Circle fled to the United States and England. Schlick remained. Although not Jewish, he was distressed by what was then happening in Germany. While walking up some steps at the University of Vienna to teach a class on June 22, 1936, Johann Nelbach a former student, confronted Schlick with a pistol and shot him. Schlick died of a chest wound. Nelbach was convicted but soon pardoned, after which he became a member of the Nazi party. Although Schlick was not Jewish, logical positivism was condemned as Jewish thought by the Nazis.
what happened in analytic philosophy of science over the course of the 20th century. The 20th century was an extraordinary period of conceptual upheaval in how science was regarded. There was a rejection of hardcore logical positivism, beginning with Hans Reichenbach, 1891-1953. Just as metaphysics and epistemology drew closer to the actual sciences. Philosophy of science itself began to look more humanistic as traditional inductive confidence in objective facts was first dislodged by Karl Popper. 1902-1994, Thomas S. Kuhn, 1922-1996. Then inverted the relationship between facts and theories with his notion of a paradigm and scientific revolutions. Over the same time period, any lingering hopes in vitalism or some non objective life force were put to rest by James D. Watson and Francis Crick's discovery of the double helix structure of DNA. However, the mapping of the human genome at the turn of the 21st century did provoke more. Nuanced views on biological determinism, opening the possibility of a new philosophy of science of biology. What's the difference between the practice of philosophy and the subject of philosophy? Besides being an activity, philosophy is also a field of study. Like psychology, history, biology, or literature. When philosophy is studied as a subject. A lot of what's studied is the history of philosophy in the form of writings by past philosophers. At the beginning of the 21st century, philosophy is mainly an academic discipline which branches off into specializations and subfields. As a practice, the activities of academic philosophers consist of college teaching and the writing of scholarly texts which are contributions and additions to the field of philosophy as a body of knowledge that can be studied. Was anything absolutely wrong in Aristotle's view? Yes. Aristotle thought that some actions were wrong in themselves and did not allow for moderation or for a mean for example, adultery, and murder. What did Edward Gibbon contribute? Edward Gibbon, 1737-1794, wrote The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which was published between 1776 and 1788. This tome is still read today. Gibbon argued that Rome fell because of invasions by barbarians and the corruption of Christianity that rendered the citizens of Rome servile and pusillanimous. Why has there been a third wave in feminism? According to its critics, 
the second wave was presumed to speak for all women while it merely propounded the interests of a small group of white, privileged American intellectual women. Who was C? I. Lewis? C. I. Lewis, 1883-1964, was the most Kantian of all the pragmatists. Although he did not become a pragmatist until he read Charles Sanders Pierce's, 1839-1914, papers. When he was given an office in the library room where they were stored at Harvard. Lewis was born in Stoneharn, Massachusetts. His father was a shoemaker who became barred from employment due to union activism. Lewis attended Harvard as an undergraduate and returned to get his Ph.D. there. After teaching in Colorado, he then went through the tenure process at the University of California and became well known for his work in symbolic logic. But he gave up his position as associate professor there to be an assistant professor in the Harvard Department of Philosophy in 1920, where he remained until 1953, serving twice as chair. Lewis was the most famous philosopher of his generation during the 1940s. But he had become obscure by the 1960s, largely due to the success of his student W. V. Oquine. 1908-2000 Quine's success was largely based on the widespread acceptance of his refutation of the analytic-slash-synthetic distinction, which was the cornerstone of Lewis' entire philosophical edifice. Lewis' main works are A Survey of Symbolic Logic, 1918, Symbolic Logic, 1932, which was written with C. H. Lanford, Mind and the World Order, 1929. An Analysis of Knowledge and Valuation, 1946, and The Ground and Nature of the Right, 1965. What did the religious and humanist existentialists contribute? The religious existentialists reconciled Sartrean ideas of freedom with the Judaic Christian tradition. The humanist existentialists brought the more abstract aspects of existentialism into literature or develop them in different directions philosophically. What are John Stuart Mill's progressive ideas in the subjection of women? Mill begins the subjection of women, 1869, by saying that it is more difficult to argue against a position that is held on irrational grounds than one based on reasoning. René Descartes 1596-1650 made a similar claim at the beginning of his meditations. Those who hold irrational views will not be persuaded to change them by rational argument but will just look for a more profound basis of their opinion, even to the point of claiming it is the result of instinct. This set the stage for Mill's claim that the condition of women at the time 
he wrote was the result of a long historical tradition of might makes right. Combined with the power enjoyed by all men simply by being born male. He compared this condition to slavery on a number of counts, women were completely dependent on men for their livelihood. Being deprived of education and means for productive employment. Women did not have control over their own bodies or children in marriage, women lacked civil rights, such as the right to vote or own property. And women were subject to violence and rape within marriage, without legal recourse. Mill also claimed that women were trained to display the traits of mind and character or lack thereof, that would make them desirable subordinates to men. Stupidity, preoccupation with appearance, and adoration of and submission to men. Men assumed that all women wanted to be wives and mothers. Which made their exclusion of them from education and the professions ironic. To say the least. But although marriage appeared to be a contractual relationship, women did not have any real freedom to withhold their consent because they could not earn a living on their own. Against existing arguments that women were not the equals of men, Mill claimed that insofar as women had been so suppressed by their circumstances in marriage and lack of education, Men knew very little about what their true capabilities were. He claimed that the highest masculine and the highest feminine characters were clearly equal. Who was Friedrich Hegel? For sheer intellectual firepower, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, 1770-1831, was probably the most brilliant thinker of the 19th century. He was a philosopher who could think about the entire world with an Aristotelian comprehensiveness. If not an Aristotelian lucidity. What are some details of the Marquis de Sada's life? De Sada was born in the palace of Condet. His father was a count, his mother a lady-in-waiting to the princess. He attended a Jesuit college and was captain of a cavalry regiment in the Seven Years' War. After which he married the elder sister of the woman he loved, fathering two sons and one daughter. In 1766 he had a theatre constructed at his castle in Lacoste, in the 1990s. Fashion designer Pierre Cardin acquired the ruins of de Sada's castle as a site for theatre productions. He was a libertine said to have sexually abused young people of both sexes, both servants, and prostitutes. He was accused of kidnapping and abusing a woman named Rose Keller in 1768, after she escaped. He was also accused of blasphemy, which was a more serious offense at the time than the sexual crimes. When prostitutes in Paris complained of de Sada's abuse, he was exiled to his castle. Then he had an affair with his sister-in-law, for which his mother-in-law secured an arrest warrant from the king. A series of arrests and escapes in which his wife was his accomplice ensued. He was confined to an insane asylum at Charenton after being imprisoned in the Bastille. 
In the asylum, the abbe allowed him to produce plays. When he was released in 1790, his wife divorced him. What do critics of the deep ecological and animal value views claim? William F. Baxter, a law professor who passed away in 1998, argued in People or Penguins. The case for maximum pollution, 1974, that the cost of a pollution-free society would be harmful to humans. He assumed that humanism requires that humans are what matter above all else. Baxter expressed a general critical view of environmentalism held by human beings who do not believe that animals have intrinsic worth or rights equal to those of humans. How was Jonathan Swift opposed to Enlightenment values? Jonathan Swift, 1667-1745, is considered to have been at heart a sincere Christian who did not believe in the rationality of human nature, but rather thought that whenever order is established, it then begins to disintegrate. In 1709, in a project for the advancement of reason and the reformation of manners, he implored Queen Anne to begin a moral crusade against contemporary vice. However, the great irony about Swift was that his characteristic path to moral reform was through satire and sarcasm. He sent up the established respectability of his age through forays into fiction, as well as the rhetoric of a pamphleteer. Thus, when it became clear that he would not get support for the plight of the poor in Ireland, he and his friends founded the Scribe Louse Club for the sake of engaging in activity against the dunces. Swift is most famous for his 1726 satire, Gulliver's Travels. His 1,729 A Modest Proposal for Preventing the Children of Poor People from Being a Burthen to Their Parents or Country and for Making Them Beneficial to the Public was a shocking criticism of the treatment of the Irish poor in which he suggested that their babies be substituted for the traditional goose that graced the tables of absentee English landlords. What was ironic about Maurice Merleau-Ponty's last lecture? Merleau-Ponty died suddenly of a stroke while preparing to give a lecture on René Descartes, 1596-1650. He repeatedly returned to Descartes' split between the mind and the body in composing his own philosophy. He did not accept the Cartesian split, but sought to address the mind and body as a united whole. Merleau-Ponty thought that a person's own body, le corps propre, should be in its personal, individual, lived reality, a scientific subject. It is one's own body that makes consciousness corporeal. He wrote, insofar as I have hands, feet, a body, I sustain around me intentions which are 
not dependent on my decisions and which affect my surroundings in a way that I do not choose. Clearly, Merleau-Ponty's stroke proves this point because it was not something he chose. But definitely something that conclusively affected not only his surroundings but the possibility of his even having those surroundings. What's ironic is that he made his point by having a stroke. Which is very different from making a philosophical argument. What was John Searle's Chinese room argument? In his The Rediscovery of the Mind, 1992. Searle supposed that a person who understands no Chinese is locked in a room with Chinese symbols and an algorithm or computer program that can be used to automatically answer questions in Chinese. The answers are good enough to be indistinguishable from answers by a Chinese speaker. Searle insists that what is missing from this picture, which is the overall computational theory of the mind in contemporary philosophy, is understanding the person in the room does not understand Chinese. Adherence to a computational theory of mind, in response to Searle's position would probably claim that unless we go back to a mysterious ghost in the machine the behavior of the person locked in the room is exactly what is meant by understanding Chinese. As to who is right in this argument, no one knows for sure. As Jerry Fodor, 1935, noted, we, meaning philosophers of mind, do not yet have an adequate theory of mind. If you think you do, then try explaining exactly how your desire to raise your right arm results in that arm going up. Where does the soul fit into Plotinus' system of Platonic entities? All individual souls form one world soul, which comes after intelligence. Some souls are disembodied, but those that are in bodies have additional accretions. Humans, animals, and plants all have souls that are immortal. Substantial, that is, they are substances, and incorporeal, not physical. Because they are incorruptible, individual souls may be reincarnated in different bodies. The soul emanates or effulgurates from intelligence. Just as intelligence emanates or effulgurates from the one. These emanations from the one and intelligence neither detract from them nor are they willed. The same is true of the emanation of matter from the soul. Although the processes of emanation from the one, intelligence, and the soul are very natural. Plot Inus, 205-270, sometimes speaks of them as selfish descents to lower states. In emanating from intelligence, the soul is actualizing a desire to rule and it becomes too attached to its body, which can lead to its deterioration. However, even when it is incarnated, the soul also lives in intelligence. How was A? J. Era Phenomenalist
According to AIR, meaningful factual statements can be reduced to claims about sense data. While he seemed at times to temper this view. Over his career he stuck to sense data as the foundation of empirical knowledge. In a famous exchange with the ordinary language philosopher J. L. Austin. 1911-1960, Ayer defended his theory of sense data. Ayer's position was that sense data are not directly intuited until they have led to a perception of the ordinary world. With all of its normally perceptible objects, such as tables and chairs. Austin, who was a colleague of Ayer's at Cambridge. Held that Ayer's theory of sense data could not be a form of foundationism because it presupposed common sense reality. That is, Austin's claim against Ayer was that, contrary to how Ayer seemed to present his case, perceptual knowledge was not built up of sense data. Ayer defended his view by claiming that in the process of Verification sense data were necessary to confirm perceptions. Was Bacon's life as direct and clear as his ideas? No. Francis Bacon, 1561-1626, lived a complex life with active political involvement in the affairs of his time. Great ambition, and the appearance of deviousness. He was born in London and raised as a gentleman. His father, Nicholas, served Queen Elizabeth I as Lord Keeper of the Great Seal. Francis entered Trinity College, Cambridge, at age 12 and soon met the Queen. At the age of 15, he is said to have learned that he was Queen Elizabeth's illegitimate son from her secret marriage to Robert Dudley, at which Nicholas Bacon had been a witness. When his father died suddenly in 1579, it disturbed Francis' prospects for a substantial inheritance. This initiated a lifetime of debt. He began to study law and took a seat in Parliament in 1584 and again in 1586. He urged the execution of Mary Queen of Scots, a Catholic rival to Elizabeth's throne. Then he met Queen Elizabeth's favourite, Robert Devereux, second Earl of Essex, who was to prove useful as his patron for a while. Bacon applied for a succession of high offices that eluded him, although Essex helped him financially. He did get the post of Queen's Council in 1596, but it paid no salary. In 1586 he was briefly arrested for debt. He took an active role in investigating treason charges against his friend and patron. Essex, who was executed in 1601. At the age of 45, he married Alice Barnum. Who was the 14-year-old daughter of a well-connected alderman. After James I became king, Bacon was knighted. He served the king well and was rewarded with the office of solicitor, then attorney general. And finally Lord Chancellor in 1618. He again fell into debt, however. During this time he was accused and convicted of bribery. His sentence was a fine and disgrace. He continued his studies while in retirement and was honored at 
age 60 with a banquet held by his Rosicrucian and Masonic friends. The famous poet Ben Jonson attended and said of him, I love the man and do honor his memory above all others. In 1626 Bacon was in London, traveling through the snow with the king's physician. When he got the idea of using snow to preserve meat, they immediately bought a fowl, had it killed, and Bacon stuffed it with snow. He came down with pneumonia and ate the bird, hoping to regain his strength from it, but died nonetheless. What is Fodor's surprising view of evolution? Fodor is by no flight of the imagination a creationist. However, he does not accept an evolutionary psychology account of human cognition without qualification. Consider what he wrote in 1998. Nothing is known about how the structure of our minds depends on the structure of our brains. Nobody even knows which brain structures it is that our cognitive capacities depend on. Unlike our minds, our brains are, by any gross measure, very like those of apes. So it looks as though relatively small alterations of brain structure must have produced very large behavioral discontinuities in the transition from the ancestral apes to us. If that's right, then you don't have to assume that cognitive complexity is shaped by the gradual action of Darwinian selection on prehuman behavioral phenotypes. In other words, Fodor claims that it might be unnecessary to posit specific environmental conditions or even a progression of adaptive changes in order to account for the complexity of the human mind. For all we know, one small mutation might have made all the important mental difference between apes and us. What was Ralph Barton Perry's theory of value? Perry wrote that value worked like a target. Any object becomes valuable or acquires value when interest is taken in it. The moral good is the promotion of harmonious happiness which is achieved when all interests are harmonized and fulfilled. What was the nature of Nietzsche's disability? Much controversy swirls around this question. There is evidence that he was treated for syphilis at Leipzig, while being kept ignorant of the diagnosis. He is believed to have had tertiary syphilis when he died. It is not clear when Nietzsche might have caught this disease, since he lived an ascetic life. But it was perhaps the result of visiting a brothel only once or twice while he was a student. Nietzsche's health was poor throughout his life. His eyesight was weak and he had gastrointestinal pains that he treated himself by walking and by taking a plethora of pills. In January 1889, Nietzsche broke down in a street in Turin, his arms around a horse that had been beaten. Over the next few days, 
he wrote demented letters to his friends. Claiming to have been crucified by German doctors in a very drawn out manner. And ordering the Emperor of Germany to report to Rome so that he could be shot. His friends brought him back from Italy, and his mother put him in a clinic in Jena. The treatment was unsuccessful, though, and his mother brought him home. In 1893, his sister, Elizabeth, returned from Paraguay, where her husband had committed suicide. She took charge of the editing and publication of Nietzsche's manuscripts and isolated him from his friends. When their mother died in 1897, Elizabeth brought Nietzsche to Weimar, where she allowed people to see him. Nietzsche was not communicative, but she had him dressed up anyway. So that she could display him. He was by then very famous. How did race become important in feminist philosophy? The complexity of feminist issues of race were underscored by University of California at Los Angeles Law Professor Kimber Cruz has groundbreaking paper Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex, a Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine Feminist Theory and Anti-Racist Politics, University of Chicago Legal Forum 139-67, 1989 Kimberla's work introduced the problems of intersectionality whereby oppress ions due to race and gender can't simply be added because they result in distinctive new identities that form a situation of new forms of discrimination. Kimberla argued that black women are not protected by either discrimination laws for women or by discrimination laws for blacks white women take precedence over them in the first instance and black men in the second. That is, anti-discrimination laws are satisfied in the letter of the law by protecting groups of women in which white women dominate, and groups of blacks in which men dominate. The result is that black women are not legally protected as black women.